He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Well, welcome back. It's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Thank you for being here today. We've got somebody that I've been super excited to talk to, Dr. William Davis, author of Wheat Belly and uh, several other books. Phil, thanks for getting him. Dr. Davis, Bill, welcome. It's good to have you here. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really... So, Phil, tell, tell us why, why, why we grabbed this guy. Sure I thing. Know, but I, I want people to hear. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really a bit of an honor, you know, the metabolic health movement and uh, his book, uh, Wheat Belly, which uh, came out over a decade ago, was really groundbreaking and uh, earth shattering in a number of ways. And uh, he had a number of subsequent books, including Undoctored and now most recently Super Gut. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, has always sort of attracted me, I guess, to uh, Bill is his uh, similar background to mine. Bill is a cardiologist by training. And, um, you know, as we're going to get into during this discussion, um, had really early on, I would say earlier than most realized, uh, you know, where our medical system was kind of going off track and uh, started talking about that. So I'm really excited for this conversation. And I think a good place to start the conversation would be to hear uh, from you, Bill, a little bit more about that sort of early part of your journey, how you went from, um, you know, the kind of typical mainstream medical uh, cardiologist and, and training that we all receive and how you realized so early on that we were, you know, headed down the wrong pathway. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. So I came from the same world as Dr. Ovedia. That is, uh, I would refer people for bypass surgery to Dr. Ovedia's colleagues. I did angioplasty, uh, instant implantation, all that sort of thing. But uh, I was brought to Milwaukee to set up the new technologies. There were some hospitals here, a little behind the times. So they brought me in to bring them up to speed. But six months into my move here, my mom died of sudden cardiac death after a successful two-vessel coronary angioplasty. So it now, really hold was on. a angioplasty. You got to remember, you don't have this. This is not a medical audience. <laughs> We're dummies like me. What's the angioplasty? So it was a balloon angioplasty. They dilate the balloon. a balloon to open, a, open an artery. So gotcha. she had this right. done in New Jersey where I grew up and she died about four months later. But it was a vivid illustration to me that this disease that so my, my mom died of the disease I managed every day that Dr. Ovedia bypasses every day. So she died of this disease. It was an illustration of how unsatisfactory it is to manage a disease in a hospital, in a cath lab, in an operating room. Well, back then, this is, this is about 26, 27 years ago, a long time ago. I asked, well, gee, what could I have done to identify the fact my mom was at risk of sudden cardiac mm -hmm. death, heart attack, et cetera. Is there something you can do a year ahead of time, five years, 10 years? Well, the world relies on this ridiculous idea that cholesterol is the predictor. Of course, that is, a, that is an absurdity. It should have been discarded 40, 50 years ago, but it makes so much money that it's still used as a crude mm -hmm. and virtually useless predictor of cardiovascular events. Well, back then, this remains true today. The only really helpful predictor is a coronary calcium score generated on a CT heart scan. This goes so far back that we were doing a, an electron beam tomography device, the precursor to the uh, multi-detector CT scanners. So we're scanning people left and right in Milwaukee. And when you look for hidden heart disease, these are people like you and me going for a walk, riding our bikes, going to work, going to school, not having chest pain, not having heart attacks, just going about their business. But when you look for silent early heart disease, you see it everywhere. Well, what do you do about it? Well, 25 years ago, all we had was statin cholesterol drugs, right? Baby aspirin, low fat right. diet, low saturated fat diet, uh, uh, exercise. So we did that. We helped publish these data. If you do nothing and your score, let's say is 500, normal is zero. So 500 is a bad score. If you do nothing, the score is going to go up about 25% per year. And you get closer and closer to heart attack, sudden cardiac death, 
needing bypass, needing stent, whatever. Well, if you go on a high dose of a statin cholesterol drug, baby aspirin, low-fat diet, exercise program, how much does the score go up? 25% per year. My colleagues to this day call that optimal medical therapy, and it does not work. Uh, certainly from a carnal calcium score perspective. Well, what do you do? I have thousands of people freaking out on me. Unfortunately, some of my unscrupulous colleagues would say, oh, Jack, you need the real test, a heart catheterization and a preventive stent implantation or bypass. Dr. Ovedia knows that's oh, preventive stent yes. implant. Yes, it's malpractice. It's malpractice. Holy Jack, it's done crap all the time. On a biscuit. It's done all the time. Phil, hold on, hold on just a minute. One of the one of the ongoing jokes in this podcast is I I came into this deeply cynical about the medical environment, the medical system, and really trying to be less cynical. And Phil keeps telling me stuff that has convinced me I haven't been cynical enough. Okay, carry on. Preventative stints. I'm just yeah. I'm, uh, my it's, mind it's, is it's sadly very common because people are terrified and that's used. Jack, you're a walking time bomb. I can't be responsible for your safety when you leave here if you don't take my advice and go through the procedure. They're very good at that. Well, what do you do, though, if you want to honestly put a stop to this? Well, it took some zigzagging, some trial and error, but it led to lessons like this. When you add vitamin D to the mix, it was the first time I saw coronary calcium scores drop. Dramatically, I mean, scores of 700 dropping to 380 or something like that. It also led to lessons that we don't, we, 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 we ignore cholesterol panels, throw them away, ignore them, black them out. <laughs> and we do lipoprotein, the real test, the particles in the bloodstream that actually cause heart disease, for which cholesterol is meant to be a crude indirect marker. But you can actually measure the lipoprotein. It's very easy. I've been doing it for over 25 years. And you'll see that. By, by far and away, the most consistent cause for coronary calcium score for coronary disease is an excess of small LDL particles. Uh, and so I asked, what foods cause small LDL particles? Well, this science was well sorted out from uh, UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, from Hopkins. A number of uh, centers had done these studies. And an excess of small LDL particles is caused only by grains and sugars, period. Not fat, not butter. Not saturated fat, not beef, grains and sugars. The amylopectin wow. A of grains and sucrose, fructose, and related sugars. So I had people, because they're all uh, terrified, having high scores, they have silent coronary disease. We take wheat and gra wheat grains and sugar out of the diet, and small LDL drops from a typical number of like 1,800 nanomoles per liter, particle count per volume, to zero. Or something close. In other words, it wasn't just a 20% improvement, 30%. It was decimation, it was obliteration of that abnormality in most cases. Wow. But people would come back and they say, I did it, but you didn't tell me I'd lose 73 pounds. You didn't tell me my type 2 diabetes would go away and I'd have to get off insulin and my three diabetes drugs. You wouldn't tell me, you didn't tell me I'd have to get off my three blood pressure drugs. My blood pressure was so low. You didn't tell me that my psoriasis would go away. <laughs> you didn't tell me. In other words, I stumbled for the purposes of coronary calcium scores and eradication of small LDL particles. I stumbled into something. And that's what I asked. Well, what the hell is going on here? That if, if we do something completely contrary to all conventional dietary advice from the U.S. government, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, USDA, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we do the exact opposite and spectacular, breathtaking things happen in health. First, I thought I was wrong. Well, how, how could this possibly yeah, be? of course. As I dug into what agribusiness had been up to the last 40 years, it became clear why this all happened. Okay, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but you can't drop a nugget like that and not expand on it. Agribusiness. Uh, okay, so wheat in particular. Wheat, of course, is the dominant grain. It's pushed on us by all, uh, by industry, by uh, uh, government agencies, by agencies that dispense dietary advice. Well, wheat is now not a four and a half foot tall, five foot tall plant. It is a, an 18 inch tall, thick stalk, large seed, large seed head plant that was put through uh, essentially thousands of genetic experiments in the 60s. 
not be, not for evil purpose, but to increase yield per acre to help the, feed the poor, the hungry mm -hmm. of the world. And it worked. Uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who is the chief uh, engineer of this process uh, um, from the University of Minnesota, developed the high yield semi dwarf strain of wheat with a yield of about four to eight fold more per acre, which is huge. He was he was he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was celebrated, and this became the dominant form of wheat in the mid 1980s. Now, there's a lot of things wrong with this thing. It's changed dramatically, and the proteins in it are also changed dramatically. And there was ever there was never a question of suitability for human consumption. But one of the things that changed, for instance, is the gliadin protein. And that change in the gliadin protein caused a fourfold increase in celiac disease. That is the intolerance to the gluten in, in wheat. Uh, it also caused the gliadin protein to be a much more potent appetite stimulant. So the gliadin. So we have to remember that all grains are seeds of grasses. Right. And last I checked, you guys aren't ruminants. You only have one stomach, not, not. four or five. <laughs> so we can't consume grasses, and yet we try. And what, what, when we do, when you ingest uh, the seeds of grasses, like grains, you can't digest all the proteins down to amino acids like you would say an egg or a piece of pork chop. You break them down into peptide fragments that are four or five amino acids long, and these have opioid effects. They go to the brain and they stimulate appetite. This is research, by the way, from the National Institutes of Health. This is not some airy fairy thing, some a naturopath made up. This is this is this is this is genuine science. That was one thing. Farmers also, farmers and agribusiness selected strains of wheat for increased content of something called wheat germaglutinin and phytates. Wheat germaglutinin, it, they like these things because they're pest resistant. It allows the wheat plant to resist molds and insects. Uh, so they chose strains with greater and greater and greater quantities of uh, wheat germaglutinin and phytates. Well, wheat germaglutinin is a problem because it's a very potent bowel toxin to humans. Extremely potent. And the phytates are known to bind all positively charged minerals like calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, and you poop them out in the toilet. So we're told you must eat grains for fiber and for B vitamins. Oh we're not told that they virtually God. guarantee numerous mineral deficiencies like magnesium and calcium and iron, zinc. And so, um, uh, and there's, there's other problems with modern wheat, but the key here is once you look past all the nonsense, we're told, Cut your fat, eat more healthy whole grains, and do the opposite. Eat more fat, never eat grains. <laughs> Wonderful things happen. Yeah, it's really just, uh, you know, inspiring to hear, you know, what science, what medicine is supposed to be. You know, we ha we as physicians are supposed to be curious. We're supposed to be asking these questions. And most importantly, we're supposed to be, you know, looking at the results that we are achieving with these, you know, interventions and, you know, when we're seeing that they're not working, uh, when we're seeing that heart disease remains the number one killer in the United States and worldwide, you know, without any noticeable impact, despite what we're supposed to be, you know, the treatment, we figured out the cause and we have the treatment and we just need to lower everyone's LDL cholesterol. And yet we haven't really seen any meaningful impact on heart disease. You know, more physicians need to be asking questions like this and need to be saying, you know, why, why are we continuing to do this? It was okay to have the theory. It was okay to test the theory. Um, but we have all the evidence that we need that the theory is wrong. And yet, if you question these, uh, you know, these basic things now, um, you get labeled as, you know, heretics and quacks and, and uh, things like that. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just, so inspiring to hear and, and uh, amazing to hear. And, you know, the um, the gut toxicity aspect of all of this uh, certainly leads into uh, your new book, great book called Super Gut, um, you know, highly recommended to anyone interested in health and metabolic health. Um, but realizing that, you know, again, the foods that we eat are the primary determinants of our health. And, you know, one of the ways that the foods that we eat can be uh, damaging our health is by damaging our gut. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, your how you came to realize this and then, you know, sort of uh, yeah. some of the concepts that you talk about in the new book. 
to help people reverse the problem and heal their guts and heal their health. Yeah, please. Well, so doing my basic programs before super gut, wheat belly, uh, uh, undoctored, et cetera, I saw people have spectacular successes. And the program is very simple. It's eat no wheat, no grains. We cap our net carb intake to 15 grams net carbs per meal, no more than. And then uh, address several su- nutrients that are lacking in modern life, like magnesium. We drink we drink filtered water and water filtration removes all magnesium. But you have to do that because there's, there's uh, sewage and herbicides and other things in water. So we supplement magnesium. We don't get enough vitamin D because most of us work indoors. As we age, we lose the capacity to activate vitamin D in the skin, even with sun exposure. Iodine, I'm in uh, Wisconsin, but this area, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, uh, et cetera, used to be called the goiter belt. And people have forgotten that, that goiters uh, were a huge public health problem all throughout human history. If you're ever in Italy or Rome or Paris or any place that has old museums of Greek statues and Roman statues, look at the statues and look at their thyroid glands right here in the neck. You'll occasionally see goiters on the statues. Actually, this on was the a statue. huge problem all throughout human history. So iodine was a, is a solution, but we've been told use less salt because the FDA misinterpreted uh, the cause for hypertension. They thought it was salt. Uh, excess salt use, even though the FDA originally told us to use uh, iodized salt, not recognizing that it was the silly advice to cut fat, eat more healthy whole grains that causes insulin resistance and sodium retention. So we don't limit salt and we get iodine from supplements like kelp. And we, of course, supplement omega-3 fatty acids because most modern people don't eat brains anymore and don't can't eat enough fish because we have mercury exposure and cadmium from shellfish. So we address diet, those handful of nutrients, that handful of nutrients, by the way, all address insulin resistance. So a lot of stuff unwinds when you do this. But it also became clear that while people enjoyed huge benefits, sometimes they fell short. They'd say things like, yeah, I, I lost 58 pounds. I'm no longer type 2 diabetic. But my hemoglobin A1C hasn't come down all the way. I, it was 12.3%, which is t- terrible. That's that index of long-term blood sugar. It's now 5.9% much better, but not perfect. 5.0% would be perfect. Or I, I'm intolerant to tomatoes and eggplants, nightshades, and I can't eat them. And I still have that intolerance. So it was clear that there was something residual despite the great success. So I looked for why would this be? I looked in the microbiome and I found answers. One of the things that we all have to accept as, as, as modern people, we have decimated our intestinal microbes. We've killed off hundreds of species. And when you lose, these species did good things for us. When you lose those species, unhealthy, mostly stool species proliferate, like E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, they proliferate. And in many people, I think in over 100 million Americans, easily over 100 million Americans, these stool microbes have ascended up into the small bowel, the ileum, jejunum, duodenum, and stomach, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, and and when they die. So when you have 30 feet of microbes, trillions of them, living and dying rapidly, they only live for hours. They don't live very long. But they live and die. When they die, some of their breakdown products enter the bloodstream. Very important process called endotoxemia. But that tells us now with confidence how microbes in the GI tract can be experienced as depression or Alzheimer's dementia in the brain or as the joint and muscle pain of fibromyalgia or restless leg syndrome or in the skin as rosacea or psoriasis or as food intolerances, whether it's nightshades, FODMAPs, legumes, fruit, fructose, um, uh, all the different kinds of uh, food intolerances people have go away when you address the intestinal microbiome, especially that problem of 30 feet of microbe SIBO. Wow. <laughs> okay, you said when, when they die, they, some of the, what breaks down from, from their bodies enters the bloodstream through a process known as what? And, endotoxemia because endotoxemia. the, thing that, the okay. primary thing that enters the bloodstream is endotoxin. 
Yeah. Right. It's a, it's talk. You, you become toxic through something that happens internally. Okay. Yeah. Very, very fascinating stuff. It, it actually, you know, ironically, I started my, uh, you know, career in medical school doing research on, uh, you know, endotoxin LPS, uh, is another name for it. And, uh, you know, its effects, uh, I was working in a trauma surgery lab at the time, um, which is certainly, uh, you know, another, uh, thing that can cause endotoxemia. Uh, but, uh, it's just interesting to circle back to it. And, you know, I've admitted, uh, many times, I think on this show, you know, some of my failings as a young doctor and, um, you know, I'll admit now that, you know, hearing things like this and talking about the microbiome, you know, five, seven, 10 years ago, you know, I would have said this is, uh, you know, woo woo alternative medicine, you know, quack stuff. And now, you know, I, I have fully come to realize how important it is and, you know, how, you know, how much it is actually helping patients to get better. Um, and, uh, you know, you and I have these similar experiences where, you know, for the first time in our careers, we are really curing people of diseases. We are reversing their diseases, um, not just treating the symptoms of it. And, um, you know, talk a little bit about what a difference that is, you know, as a physician to be able to actually help people improve instead of just, you know, manage their suffering better, which is really most of what we were trained to do as physicians manage their suffering. Oh. You know, I, I find one of the hardest things for people to embrace is to get rid of this idea that we're going to treat diseases. In other words, if we're going to treat type 2 diabetes, we give you drugs like insulin to reduce blood sugar, but that has nothing to do with the cause. And in fact, if you give somebody insulin, it makes the disease much worse. One of the effects of insulin is a fabulous weight gain drug. It's very common to gain 25 to 50 pounds in the first year you're put on insulin. So it makes the situation worse. So that's treating. So treating is filled with problems. So I tell people, and this is tough for people to, to grasp, but let's address the factors that allow disease to emerge in the first place. Because regardless of the label given to you, whether it's called obesity or type 2 diabetes or coronary disease or migraine headaches or rosacea or psoriasis or ulcerative colitis or irritable syndrome, let's address the common causes, diet, nutri lack of nutrients, and disrupted microbiome. And as Dr. Avedia points out, people are cured. They're not dealing with something. Their type 2 diabetes, more often than that, goes away without drugs, their coronary disease becomes quiescent or even regresses. Their ulcerative colitis reverses uh, over and over and over again. We are seeing people gain real control. Now, but what, what's the healthcare system going to do if it can't dispense procedures and pharmaceuticals? So you can see the, the, the resistance to all this. Absolutely. Yeah. And this all, Oh, go ahead. I was oh, just... I, I, I'm just thinking about um, you guys continue to give me more and more reasons to realize that my intuition as a 20 year old, that which was the authorities were full of shit, um, that I was right. And I, I've watched the medical system over my lifetime. What it has appeared to me has been happening from the outside, you guys are confirming is exactly what is happening. You people on the inside are, and what it looked like to me was, um, a system designed to keep people, uh, enslaved. I don't know if that's a too strong a word, but I, I've started, I've started saying that, uh, patients are, are, are not customers to the insurance companies, their crops. Um, and I, I don't think I'm overstating it. So I'm just, I had to vent a little there. This is all just, <laughs> all right. You know, Sorry. Jack, I don't think it's purposely evil. I, I call it willful ignorance. That is, uh, our colleagues focus on the things that are likely to generate revenue and tend to just ignore the things that don't lead to revenue generation. 
So if I can do put in three stents, get paid many thousands of dollars, or I could show somebody how to manage their vitamin D, how to manage small LDL particles, address their microbiome, and watch their coronary disease become quiescent, it, it hardly pays anything. And so there's there's not a lot of big profit motive in dispensing health. But you know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to help people become healthy. And it's it's just, you know, and that's why I'm so grateful for Dr. Ovedia that he he is a gem. <laughs> there's I can count on two fingers the number of thoracic surgeons in this world who actually talk about health. Well, that I'll bring, I, I agree. I have, having, having Phil come into my life has been one of the highlights of, of my last year. I have learned so much. Some things I wish I, I didn't know. But um, I'm, I want to ask you about, um, undoubtedly, um, your medical colleagues and researchers and scientists received this information with great joy and have heaped accolades on you. Um, undoubtedly, you've been nominated for several worldwide prizes. Tell us about that. Well, the, the truth, Jack, I'm sure Phil will tell you the same, is most of our colleagues don't give a shit. They don't pay attention to this stuff. They don't read books. They don't participate in conversations. This doesn't sound terribly cynical, but I was guilty of it too when I was in the cat lab and a good looking blonde in a miniskirt comes in and tells me, doctor, did you want to go on an all expense paid trip to Orlando for all our key decision makers? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> or you know how this, how the world works. And that's where a lot of the education comes from. The education comes from. It's not from reading the science. It's not from participating in debate. And, and there's this process of willful ignorance. So there's very little awareness or there's outright dismissal. They'll say things like, well, that's not consistent with the guidelines, the dietary guidelines. And they accept the dietary guidelines at face value as dispensed by the diet, by the dietitians. And so there's not a whole, so I expected a ton of pushback. There's, there's not a lot of pushback because they simply don't care. Oh my Lord. It's not even pushback. It's just, they simply ignore you. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, we. I, I, I can't believe I still have the capacity to be surprised with all the stuff you've dumped on me in the last year, but I'm still just. Oh. Yeah, certainly, okay. you know, ahead, <laughs> we would uh, hope that, you know, uh, Dr. Davis would be invited to talk to the American Heart Association, you know, meeting every year, you know, the leading or, or you know, the meeting where the most cardiologists show up. I hesitate to call it the leading meeting, but, um, you know, <laughs> and, and he's right that concepts like this are just not, uh, you know, uh, are just not invited or not uh, welcome. Um, so, you know, along those lines, the challenge becomes, you know, getting this information directly to the people. Um, and really, yes. you know, I think ultimately that's the way that we are going to um, have an influence. Uh, and, you know, of course, you've been fighting that battle now for, you know, well over a decade, uh, close to two decades. Um, talk, talk a little bit about your experience with that and getting the message out, you know, when you write these books and you... Um, you know, have have this uh, platform. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you've come up against uh, trying to get this information in the hands of the people who would benefit from it? Well, one of the things that happened I, that I noticed with my undoctored book in 2015 was uh, I, I'd been on, I, I don't personally care to be on big media, but you got to do it to spread the message. So I was on Dr. Oz four times, CBS this morning, a number of times, had a PBS show. In other words, made, made the rounds of all major media. But I wrote the book Undoctored and found all doors slammed shut. And I was no longer welcome on any media. And by the way, that's so it's so important for what you're, you guys are doing right here, uh, broadcasting the message. Uh, so I thought it was me. It turns out to be virtually all um, people who have a message of health or nutrition. So major media has essentially blacklisted anybody who wants to talk about health. You know, it used, wasn't that long ago. You could turn on morning news and they'd have an author on a health or nutrition topic and they'd talk about it. Watch morning news now. You'll see there is zero conversation about nutrition and health unless it involves conventional health care. And of course, it's never critical of conventional health care, even though modern health care is a trillion dollar disaster. 
that is bankrupting people left and right, even people with insurance. But there's no conversation about this at all because it's contrary to the interests of the advertisers, Big Pharma, spending about $6 billion a year in advertising. And so now if Dr. Ovedia or I want to go on major media and talk about a book, a topic, uh, an event, we're not allowed. We, we, they will not uh, bring us on anymore. So, you know, ironically, the legislation to allow direct-to-consumer drug advertising was based on the idea that corporations have the right of free speech just as individuals do. But the, I, I, the ironic thing is that now they have squashed free speech and yeah. everyday people cannot hear, are not allowed to hear health messages through major media. And this, by the way, is print also. Mm, print also? Expand on Also that. in major print media, magazines and newspapers. Ah, okay. All right. Well, I, I wish I could say I'm surprised, but I'm not. I will say this um, in, in response to that. Joe Rogan has more listeners in a week than ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, CNN news shows combined. Completely outside the mainstream media, completely um, free of any kind of gatekeepers whatsoever. So uh, folks like you and I who grew up with three or four major broadcast channels that disseminated all the news and a half a dozen newspapers that were the papers of record. It's still easy to be in that mindset that those are the ones that matter. But the reality is those things that used to matter, those media outlets that used to matter simply don't matter anymore. And, and the last two years have proven irrefutably that not only do they not matter, but they are, they are actively operating as instruments of oppression. Um, and here we have this. I mean, Dr. Ovedia's podcast has gone from zero. We started in, what was it, September, Phil? Mm -hmm. uh, we started 10 months, nine months ago. Um, he's already one of the top 10% of the podcasters in the world. Um, and obviously there's, there's an, a tremendous hunger for that kind of, for this kind of information. So, so as, as aggravating, irritating and nauseating as the reaction of the mainstream media is to this kind of information, the good news is we're not dependent on them anymore. We route around them. Um, this information is getting out. I mean, good Lord, I look at the growth statistics on this podcast week after week and I'm just like, I, I, I personally have never been involved with anything that does what this is doing. That's and great. Clearly we're meeting a need. All right. So enough, enough about that. Um, I'd like, to, I'd like you to go a little bit deeper now with um, the, the wheat belly and the microbiome. What, what's it? Super gut? Mm -hmm. Super gut. Um, yep. Go a little deeper there with, with that. Um, I know with wheat belly, if, if we were going to boil the book down to one, one phrase or one, one word, it would be stop eating wheat. I realize there's a lot more to it than that, but, um, talk about super gut and, and help us put the, put the pieces together. So two, two basic principles. One is that overgrowth issue, the SIBO, as well as dysbiosis, disrupted bowel flora confined to the colon. These are responsible for a huge number of health problems but the other part of this is the loss of healthy microbes, and we can replace a lot of them. Yeah, that's so, the thing I was wondering about. Mm -hmm. So my favorite is Lactobacillus reuteri, R-E-U-T-E-R-I, named after the German microbiologist who discovered it in human breast milk in 1962. Well, back then, he, he it was easy to recover this microbe. As his 40-year career unfolded, he found it harder and harder and harder to find people with this microbe. More recent surveys show that almost nobody has it anymore. Wow. So this, this microbe, when, when restored, does some spectacular things. So it, it's, it's unique in that it colonizes the entire GI tract, small bowel as well as colon, where it sends a signal via the vagus nerve to the brain to release the hormone oxytocin. So yes. your listeners might remember what oxytocin is, the hormone of love and empathy. And so when you restore this microbe, people say, 
I like other people better. I like my coworkers better. They're less annoying to me. My favorite is I understand other people's points of view better. Oh my now, ladies God. love it because the boost in oxytocin causes an explosion, dermal collagen, and they start to lose their wrinkles. Oh. Guys love it because you get a restoration of youthful muscle and strength. You get deeper sleep. I'm a chronic insomniac. Now I, I now sleep nine hours straight through vivid dreams. Your libido goes up. You have greater erotic content of your dreams. The ladies have Stop preservation. Stop right there. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Guys, you want to have sexy dreams? Get your gut taken care of. I love it. <laughs> but, you know. If, There's got to be a product in here. Things. But the ladies, they all, they, you know, the ladies tell me, they say, we don't care about the empathy. We don't care about the muscle or bone density or sleep. We just want less wrinkles. So that's what's driving a lot of this. Is there, that, is that, there that, an that's ethnic, like, is there an ethnic uh, variation in this? Are, do, are some ethnicities more or less prone to um, having or not having this, this uh, microorganism in our guts? Pr- probably not. There's not been any exploration of that question. But uh, so one of the things to keep in mind is that Reuteri, this microbe, is unusually sensitive to common antibiotics like amoxicillin or ampicillin. So if you took amoxicillin, say, for a sinus infection at age 35, you probably lost all your Reuteri and other microbes. And so you've lost that ability to boost oxytocin. So spectacular things happen when now what we do. So this this all happened uh, several years ago and the microbe I wanted comes from a company in Sweden called BioGaia. And they sell it to you as a product called Gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S. Well, that's a tablet intended for infants because this microbe given to infants reduces colic, reduces regurgitation of breast milk or formula. Uh, in other words, modest benefits. But the tablets had so few bacteria in them because they're made for babies that I got the tablets, I crushed them and made yogurt out of it. Not yogurt in the conventional sense. It's really just a, it's a way to increase bacterial counts. So we use extended fermentation. So in, in commercial fermentation of yogurt, they ferment for four hours. You know, microbes don't have sexual reproduction. There's no mommy and daddy microbes. They just double asexual reproduction. One becomes two, two becomes four. Well, Rotary doubles every three hours. Commercial yogurt making is a four-hour process. So if we did like they do in a factory, you'd have nothing. So we ferment for 36 hours. We did perform flow cytometry studies on the yogurts. And it looks like 36 hours is the magic number. Beyond 36 hours, you get degradation in numbers because of competition for for nutrients. So 36 hours, we get about 250 billion counts of bacteria per half cup serving. So by making the yogurt with extended fermentation, starting with Rotary, I, I, I regret calling it yogurt, not yogurt. But it looks and tastes like yogurt. So, uh, but we've increased the microbial count from the start by a thousand fold. And that's probably part of the reason we get these big, big, big effects. Now, that's one microbe. There's plenty of others you can get and have other effects like uh, shrink your waist or reduce arthritis pain or reduce uh, uh, restless leg syndrome or there's a whole long list of effects. Better competitive, better competition as an athlete, less muscle breakdown. So there's, it's like a menu. I tell people it's like going to a restaurant right. and, and the waitress gives you a menu. You don't freak out because you can't order every appetizer and main dish and, and, and dessert. You pick and choose the dishes you want. Same thing here. You can pick and choose the effect you want and the microbe you want. And then we ferment it to high numbers. It doesn't have to be dairy, by the way. It can be other things too. And you get these really high counts and you can get things like smoother skin, less muscle breakdown, lower, less arthritis pain, uh, smaller waist, uh, so reduced anxiety. So it's, it's as simple as just simply taking this orally, simply ingesting it, eating it. That's, Mm -hmm. that's it. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, so this SIBO process, that's the other issue that is 30 feet of microbes. Uh, sending endotoxin to your bloodstream, raising blood sugar, raising blood pressure, causing depression, all those other effects outside the GI tract. 
you know, the conventional answer, what, as Phil will tell you, the conventional answer is to usually ignore it or be ignorant of it. But the few gastroenterologists who do pay attention can prescribe an antibiotic called rifaximin, which has a very poor track record. It's not very good. It's not very effective. But efficacy may be as low as 25%, at best, maybe 60%, with no advice, of course, typically on how you got it, how you got this SIBO issue, what you can do to increase efficacy, and what you can do to prevent recurrences. Well, I ask a different set of questions. I ask, well, gee, if you have SIBO and you took a commercial probiotic, will the SIBO go away? No, <laughs> it might, you might get less bloating or diarrhea, but you'll still have SIBO. So I asked, what if we chose microbes that colonize the upper GI tract? That's where SIBO is. And what if we chose microbes that produce what are called bacteriocins? These are natural antibiotics effective against the species of SIBO. So I chose three, our friend Lactobacillus rotari. I chose a strain of Lactobacillus gasseri the BNR17 strain, uh, because it produces up to seven bactericins and likewise colonize the upper GI tract, I chose a strain of Bacillus coagulans. We co-fermented these three, prolonged fermentation for bigger bacterial counts, and crossed my fingers, as preliminary experience of about 30 people who've done this, 90% have converted to negative. We also have this device. This is the AIR device, A-I-R-E, that measures hydrogen gas. It's a mapping device that tells you where microbes live in your GI tract. So you want to know if they're way up high, as occurs in SIBO, or whether they're way down low in the colon. This will tell you. It maps it out. Unfortunately, the, the guy it measures hydrogen gas in the breath. The bacteria you produce you hydrogen gas. Exhale into it. Blow into it. So you blow into it. It registers on your smartphone, zero to ten. Gotcha. Now the the, okay. the odd twist in all this is that the inventor. Dr. Angus Short, uh, a young engineer from Dublin, Ireland, who invented this for his fiance, now wife, who had irritable bowel syndrome and was told to go on a low FODMAPS diet, low fiber, low sugar diet to reduce bloating and diarrhea. Well, he saw how tough it was for her and how she'd slip up and have gas and diarrhea. So he invents this device thinking it's a device to uh, check for incomplete fermentation. Well, he releases it in 2018. I call him up. I say, Angus, that's not what this is. <laughs> what, what you invented, is not, that's not what it is. It's a mapping device to tell you where microbes live. But now they're changed, the court, they're changed the entire course of the company because of this. But I tell you this because if you order it, and the current one's black, by the way. This is the old one. My, my new one's in the kitchen. Um, the instructions that come with it are wrong. They'll tell you how to use it for IBS with FODMAPs. So I have seven pages in my super gut. It's not that tough. Sounds like a lot, but there's seven pages on how to use it to use it as a mapping device. What's and the thing called? What's Air, it called? A-I-R-E. And the okay. company is called Food Marble. And by the way, we, we will perform a formal clinical trial to see if that, what I call SIBO yogurt, the three microbes, we won't give it as yogurt, though. I have to encapsulate it uh, just because in a clinical trial, you can't give people. You could, but it's imprecise. So we'll probably encapsulate and do it as a probiotic. But I think we have stumbled on a way to eradicate SIBO using a form of yogurt. So just to make sure I understand the mechanism, you, you looked at, at, at a set of symptoms. You said what naturally occurring bacteria uh counteract those symptoms in those locations in the body through one mechanism or another, and then put together this formula, uh, that does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now we consume it for four weeks. You know, there's a lot of things here to uh, explore how long you needed to eat it, etc. cetera. Uh, this is very preliminary. So I, I, I warn people, this is but based on 30 people so far, and we have a device now, a consumer device that allows us to determine whether or not the one peculiar, peculiar twist in all this is that because rotary colonizes the upper GI tract, which we want, and produces hydrogen gas, it gives you a false positive. It's really a true positive, but it's, for all practical purposes, it's a right. false positive. So what you have to do is you make your, your tent, your, testing tens or other high number at the start, eat the yogurt for four weeks, 
Don't eat the yogurt for two weeks, then retest. And you can see, because rotoride will not take up long-term uh, residence in the GI tract. Um, if they aren't taking up long-term residence, how do you keep them in your GI tract? Well, you, you ask a fundamental question, Jack, that's not been answered by anybody. But it's, it's like, so if mom gave you this microbe, you'd likely have it for years, if not a lifetime, if you didn't get exposed to such things as antibiotics. But if you take it as a probiotic or as a yogurt, it only takes up resin for a few days or weeks. Well, why would that okay. be? It's probably because microbes, just like humans, you know, we don't live alone, right? We live with families, neighbors, friends, colleagues, coworkers. We live in communities. Bacteria are the same. They live in communities or guilds or consortia. So it's likely in future, we won't say get rotari, we'll say get rotari and these seven other species with which it collaborates. There's only one product, by the way, on the market in which that phenomenon has been incorporated, and it's the BiotaQuest sugar shift product that my microbiologist friend, Dr. Raul Cano, invented. He, he found this group of microbes, it does include rotari, by the way, uh, that collaborate. In this case, in, in consuming sugars in the GI tract, consume sucrose, fructose, uh, glucose, and converge it to mannitol, a sugar that I've, humans I've cannot that digest. Hmm? Metatol? Mannitol? Mannitol. Mm -hmm. And it's a sugar that is indigestible, so we just excrete it. It doesn't, right. get, we don't metabolize it. But because this group of microbes, this collaborative guild of microbes in this sugar shift, consume sugars in the GI tract, reduces your blood sugar. So we right. put 20 people on that product, non-diabetics, and it reduced their fasting glucose by 9.8 milligrams per deciliter, which is quite substantial. Now, the reason I tell you about the mannitol is the founder of that company, Martha Carlin, is really interested in finding a better means of dealing with Parkinson's disease because her husband developed Parkinson's disease at age 44. Mm. And the real reason, even though it reduces blood sugar and it's called sugar shift, the real reason they made this uh, combination of microbes is in experimental models, mannitol crosses the brain into the brain and breaks down the alpha synuclein. That's the protein that accumulates in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. Now, they have not yet conducted their clinical trial, but anecdotally, they've given it to a bunch of people with Parkinson's, and they've seen partial remission occur. Wow. Anecdotally. Now, I, I wanted a couple of things because we've got people who are listening as well as watching. Um, if you're a listener, the little air device that Dr. Davis held up is about the size of a matchbook. Um, or one of the, the, there was an iPad years ago that was, um, an iPod years ago that was a little square, maybe an inch and a half or two inches square. That's thing one. Uh, thing two is, good Lord, I've got so busy describing the device, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. <laughs> All right. I'll, uh, I'll jump in there on that note and just, uh, you know, I, I find it so interesting that here we are, you know, two, uh, you know, two physicians who started in, you know, with uh, heart disease as our focus, and we started looking for ways to better, uh, you know, prevent and treat heart disease. And, you know, we stumble across these concepts that, you know, were originally described for um, things like uh, epilepsy and, you know, obesity and diabetes, and we find them benefiting health. And then, you know, we start talking about conditions like Parkinson and, and uh, you know, mental health. And uh, I was at the Metabolic Health Summit a few weeks ago, and, uh, you know, just hearing the, the, the wide variety of, of medical conditions and yet the answer ends up being the same pretty much. And, you know, it all just comes down to these basic concepts about the foods that we're eating and how that, you know, affects health. And, uh, you know, whether or not you believe in, in creation or evolution or however we got this way at humans, um, you know, it does just make sense that, you know, what's going to keep one particular part of our body healthy is going to be the same thing that keeps, you know, the other parts of our body healthy as well. <laughs> um, so um, it really, uh, you know, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on, on how this all circles back and, you know, 
how, you know, a cardiologist ends up, you know, looking at the microbiome and figuring out, you know, how that's going to benefit um, all of our health and, uh, you know, how we just keep circling around these same b basic concepts of just eating real food and eliminating the junk and, and letting the body heal ourself, heal itself, which is a lot of what this comes down to. You know, when you just stop putting the toxins in and damaging the body, the body is going to be able to heal itself. And I just would love to hear your thoughts on all that. You know, I think about the experience of indigenous populations like the Yanomami in Brazil, the Matsas in Peru, the Malawi in Eastern Africa, the Hadza in Tanzania, the Maasai in Kenya, the Mori in uh, New Zealand, the people in the jungles of New Guinea. These are people, they do, they have infection, of course, nematode infestations, they have injury, but they have no type 2 diabetes, ulcerative colitis, colon cancer, obesity, uh, coronary disease. They have almost none, with very rare exceptions, none of the diseases that we have. <laughs> Ironically, the anthropology community has for years called them the diseases of civilization. <laughs> so we've done a great job with infections and injury, and we are, we're terrible at the diseases of civilization because the system is bent on long-term. You know, the, the, the dream of big pharma is not a course of antibiotics for two weeks, it's a drug you take for 30 years, mm -hmm. like a blood pressure drug or a diabetes mm -hmm. drug. They want chronic health conditions. They salivate when they when you talk about chronic health conditions. And that's the stuff they want. And But as, as Dr. Ovedi is pointing out, just with a handful of strategies, you can reverse the great majority of modern diseases of civilization. You know, um, our... our, our uh episode two weeks ago, we had Dr. Brian Linskis on, and he told the story of speaking to his HMO rep um, about the great work that he was doing to help patients reverse their diabetes and complaining to the HMO that if, he, if they'd give him more time with each patient, he could save them more money by helping more patients get off insulin. And the HMO rep told him point blank, you don't save us money by doing that. You cost us money. I had to stop him and ask him to repeat because I, I wasn't sure I'd heard it right. And, I, and I'd heard it right. The HMO rep specifically said the more codes, diagnostic codes you bring in on a patient, the more money we make. You know, um, one of my favorite books is a book called Systemantics. It used to be called The Systems Bible by an author named John Gall. And it was written... Uh, from the standpoint of uh, somebody who, who, a programmer, somebody who creates um, information systems. But uh, I've been trying to find the quote as we've been sitting here. I can't find it. But the gist of it is, if you want to know the purpose of a system, look at the output. And the output of our medical system is not health. I don't think I need to say anymore. All right. Well, Bill, I feel like I could sit here and, and have this, keep this conversation going for a long time. Um, I'm interested in chemistry and microbiology, and I love to drill down into the depths, but I don't want to bore people out of their skulls. So let's do this. Uh, what's the best way for a listener unfamiliar with anything that uh, has never heard of Dr. William Davis? What's the best way? for them to get started with learning about the things that you have learned to help people? Where do they start? You know, I was, you know, I was mindful, Jack, that if they start with all the microbiome stuff, they missed all this stuff that preceded, the dietary stuff, the nutrients that are lacking in modern life, et cetera. So I tried to pack it all into the super gut program. It does incorporate all these things. Uh, now, some people do find it kind of complicated. So if, if someone wanted just an introduction to the diet, I still conduct you know, I have an old book called Wheat Belly 10-Day Brain Detox. We have a private Facebook page. People engage in it, and they still do it. It's a good way to get started with a lot of hand-holding, with cheat sheets and recipes and, and lots of support. So there's there's that book and the private Facebook page. If you just uh, if you go into my um, 
I have a new website called drdavisinfinitehealth.com. And it's kind of this starting point for a lot of those kinds of things with links to all that stuff. Great. Uh, but of course, super gut, if, if you want it in one place, super gut is, has all the recipes. It's got how to replace rotari, gasari, bacillus coagulants, and a whole bunch of other microbes for specific effects, as well as the SIBO yogurt recipe and other uh, ideas. I'm fascinated with this idea of go down your menu of what effects do you want to have and pick your, your micro uh, bacteria. To... <laughs> and that, list, I I that, think, that list is growing very quickly. We're not that far away, I think, from having a microbe or collection of microbes, for instance, that treats depression, should not treat, but <laughs> addresses depression, for instance. Well, uh, maybe there's a whole new field of medicine just waiting here of not of healing. Yeah, we know what's exciting just for me and here. Phil is uh, so many cardiac conditions are looking like the microbiome is playing a major role. Who would have thought that coronary disease can be largely driven by the microbiome? This is amazing. Atrial fibrillation driven by the microbiome. Left ventricular systolic dysfunction, congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathies may be diseases. Not entirely, perhaps. There's other factors, but a large degree are impacted by the microbiome and the endotoxemia that accompany dysbiosis. Well, it makes sense that if you're uh, poisoning yourself from the inside, one of the best things to do to get healthy. Oh, I like that is line, Jeff. I use that. <laughs> poisoning yourself from the inside. <laughs> That's a good one. Doctor, it hurts when I hit myself in the head with a hammer. Well, let's start by not hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. Oh, my. All right. Well, we're going to make sure all that stuff shows up on the show notes page. So all these links, um, I happen to know that you can actually follow Dr. William Davis on Twitter. Uh, I think that's Dr. William Davis, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that's right. Doctor, I'm sorry. At William Davis, MD. That's it. At William Davis, MD. Uh, you can follow him there on Twitter, which is, of course, my favorite place to hang out. Um, wow. Phil, it just keeps getting better and better, man. Yes, it does. <laughs> I'm loving this. I'll tell you, uh, uh, Bill, I would love to have you back, oh, you know, maybe six months from now and just do a follow up new stuff, what we found out, what, you know, and. I know there's, you've probably got story after story after story. We just flat ran out of time today. I want to hear stories too. Um, I, I went on one of your websites and just saw a handful of, of you know, those amazing stories. I'm going to tell a very, very short one. My wife stumbled onto your book, Wheat Belly, six months ago. And it clicked for her. And she by and large has, has cut out the wheat. And she talks about how instantly her joint aches mm -hmm. went away. And when she ingests wheat now, she, she knows it. She's instantly aware that she's done it. She aches, she doesn't feel good. So I personally want to thank you because your book, Wheat Belly has made my wife's and therefore my life better. Oh, that's great, Jack. Oh, I appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> Phil? Very good. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, and certainly, uh, we'd love to have you back again. And I look forward to uh, interacting more and continuing our conversation. Uh, just a couple of uh, crazy heart doctors out there trying to actually help people. How weird. <laughs> all right. Thanks, well, man. I appreciate what all you're doing. Yeah, uh, this is so much fun. I, I just I feel like, yeah, I, this is one of my favorite hours during the week. All right, well, for, for uh, Dr. William Davis, author of Wheat Belly and Super Gut, for our host, Dr. Philip Ovedia, I'm Jack Heald. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Follow Dr. Ovedia on Twitter at iFixHearts. Follow, uh, hit his website, iFixHearts.co, and take a metabolic health test. And uh, connect with him directly at his website, ovediahearthealth.com. And we will talk to you guys next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.